Welcome back to Adventures in NFTs. I'm Thomas Hunt. Today we're joined by Rick Chan from NFT Ventures. How's it going, Rick? Oh, it's going awesome. How you doing? Doing good. We're also joined by Andy Sun, known as the artist name Black Cherry. How's it going, Andy? Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks. And finally, we have Yonat Vax, who recently did the HODL, the HODL Odyssey series. How's it going, Yonat? <laughs> Very good. Good to be right. here. So, of course, we're here talking about, first, we're talking about NFT Ventures, which is a product out of Miami, where you can get NFTs and you can make NFTs if you're an artist. Uh, so, Rick, can you tell the people just a little bit more about NFT Ventures? Yeah, this is uh, Wave 2.0. So, you know, we're NFT producers. We were lucky enough to work with a lot of amazing NFT artists from both Wave 1.0 and Wave 2.0. Um, and I, I know you know some of our backstory of, you know, back in the day when we were working with NFTs and, um, you know, the challenges that we face. But, um, you know, in this wave, it's really fast paced and super exciting. It's just uh, amazing how much um, it's changed, like from week to week and month to month. And, um, you know, it's stoked to be here. Well, at first we had the problem that we couldn't get rid of these things. And now the problem is we can't stop talking about these things. And there's just new things every day, new coins, new platforms, new players. Uh, Tom Brady, uh, Rob Gronkowski, uh, incredible football players now suddenly into NFT. Snoop Dogg is hanging out on Twitter under another name. Uh, so, yeah, it's been really crazy uh, watching the space take off. No, absolutely. I mean, he's a incredible collector too. And then also in Europe and kind of the world, I mean, they have uh, what they call football soccer. That's really taking off with NFTs also. One never would have guessed the whole world loves the sport. Why wouldn't they love a tradable and collectible card? Uh, so Yonat, uh, tell us a little bit about your art. We have here your artist statement that your work is about people, memories, personal stories, and interesting moments in history or current events. Uh, what kind of art do you make and how did you get started in this art? Right. So, well, how did I get started? I've, I've always kind of been into art since I can remember myself. So that's always kind of something I loved. Um, it took me a while to get to the place of actually dedicating myself to art. I went, um, I studied, uh, so I, was always, I was always interested in, in people and stories and why kind of you know, it's the essence of humanity, why we do what we do, why we think the way we think, you know, what the stories we tell ourselves um, to make us understand this world. So in the beginning, I kind of went to study psychology and um, I was really interested in, in altered states of consciousness and, and wanted to go into research in that. But I was, I went to, to university to study and um, was very disappointed in the closed mindedness of that, those institutions. And I've always loved art. So I kind of thought, well, you know, I can be an artist and paint and do what I love. And also I use my art as kind of a research um, medium. So I kind of study the things I want about human history, about sociology. And, and through that, that's the way I make my art. So I make my art about the things um, I explore about the world. And I got into, so the art I'm doing now, I got into, I learned about, I found out about Bitcoin in early 2017. And I was already an artist then, I was already making series about different things. Um, but I was looking for something new. And, you know, I think we all know how Bitcoin kind of captures your attention and makes you um, study it the whole day and that kind of fall down that rabbit hole. And it was, it's just, it, it opened up a whole new world of so many things. And that's how I started a series about, I started a series about crypto, about Bitcoin, and I, it was mostly physical art. So it was kind of, I think you can see from the beginning, kind of my exploration, which, which I think resembles a lot of people's exploration into this space. Um, I think we, we find that we all go down the rabbit hole there. Uh, yeah. We'll get back to uh, your actual work here in a minute. I want to bring Andy in, uh, Black Cherry. Uh, you make a different kind of art, whereas Yonat, 
is working with uh, brushes and paint. It seems your work is more digital. Uh, how did you get into art? Yeah, so I've been doing art since the first thing like I can remember. I've been doing uh, digital art since I was like 11, 12, and I'm 16 now. So I've been doing digital art for about four or five years. Um, a lot of the art that I do comes from, it's crazy to say, like a lot of them start from my dreams. I see a lot of them. Um, it's a mix of my dreams and st storytelling. So each of the pieces tell a story. They're very like abstract stories, but that's what I love about art is like, if you look at a piece, it can tell a million different stories depending on the person who's looking at them. Mine are very um, abstract. Sometimes there, you can pull five, six different stories just out of a single piece. And uh, what kind of tools do you use to make this art? So um, they're all, all the art that you see is done digitally. So um, there's a lot of Photoshop. The main uh, tool I use is Blender, um, Blender 3D. That's what I use to make all my art. And then I composite it in Photoshop afterwards. Now, Yona, you mentioned that you found the university to be closed-minded. What do you think about a future where Andy is already making digital art and selling at 16? Will he need the university? Probably not. <laughs> I think it's funny. I was just talking to a friend today that said that his son is working for a video game company and earning Bitcoin. And he was like, you know, not understanding that. And I, and it just made me realize, you know what, for, don't understand it because, you know, people Andy's age do, and that's what's important. You know, the future, um, you know, the people that are going to build the future, get it without even, you know, intuitively. So. Well, and, really, if, you, if you try to explain that to someone in the eighties, you know, they work for a video game company, they get paid in Bitcoin. They don't know what any of those things are. And they're still in high school. I mean, <laughs> still high school video games had crashed. They were on their yeah. way up. There's even now professional gamers. Uh, Rick, what do you think about the future where artists can just go directly into NFTs? They don't have to graduate from some kind of college or an institution. No, I think that's great. I mean, we are talking to and working with phenoms and, and very people very young of Andy's age and different calibers and you know we've always loved gaming and we have projects coming up next year in gaming so uh, very excited now yona you mentioned your series uh the hodl c uh why don't you tell us a little bit more about that and uh how you got started making bitcoin art okay well i started making bitcoin art from the beginning i mean as i said it was my art was in the beginning kind of the exploration of bitcoin and it it, it started more with you know i started doing artwork more about trading and mining and and then it got more focused on on bitcoin and its promise of of you know new world of freedom of decentralization and and part of the way i make my work is is i always look for a story from the past to tell because i think history doesn't you know doesn't repeat but it rhymes and when we look we have to learn from history and when we look at things that happened we can kind of explain to ourselves things that are happening now and part of that story is um i, I try to tell it with replicas of things from the past so this story the the hodl i kind of took you know the story of the odyssey um, which is one of the you know most epic stories of of Western culture, um, and I made replicas of of wax tablets. So wax tablets were used in antiquity as as writing surfaces. They're the surface is made of of wax, so you can write and then you can put it in the sun. It melts and you can um, straighten it out. And this is what was used. So I made um, these replicas. It's a series of six replicas. And on each of the series, I'm painting a story that's taken, the origin is taken from the story of the Odyssey. So um, the Odyssey is kind of, is the story after the Trojan War. And one of the, one of the biggest memes of Bitcoin is, you know, the Trojan horse that Bitcoin enters, you know, governments, but it's really um, bringing freedom that they're, they don't see. Um, so this is the story after, because now, you know, there's still, there's still a lot to fight for. And this is kind of the story of Odysseus that he's 
fighting to get back home. So this is the story of Hodlysius and his return to, to Bithyca. And it's so I'm taking this- because uh, one of the things that Odysseus was fighting was his own hubris and that it was his own great name that he had to tell the Cyclops yeah. when he sailed away. And if he just stayed quiet, maybe at this point, Bitcoiners are fighting their own hubris. Yeah, I think that's one of the, that's one of the big, that's the thing, the, the story, that part of this story is all the lessons we need to learn. You know, one of the things is, you know, stay humble, stack sats, and, and things will, will, will work out. If you just believe that this is, you know, Bitcoin doesn't need, it's, it's, perfect the way it is, you know, it doesn't need, um, you know, yeah, that's part, that's part of what the story is telling. And I think the, the second part, which is the, la which is the part I recently did is about that, you know, that the story of the, of the, of the Cyclops is that he ran away from them. And at the last moment he said, no, but I did this to you. And then um, he was cursed by the gods and, and had a, a harder journey. So kind of the lesson in that is, um, yeah, to stay humble. The part of the journey is to stay humble in this. Well, and don't mess with someone whose father is connected. I think the Cyclops exactly. side in the sea god. <laughs> and, and is a uh, god, yeah. Always bad, and is a god, always bad. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Black Cherry, what do you think about Bitcoin and its epic journey? Uh, you're just kind of getting started in art and the world here. Uh, what do you think about Bitcoin so far? Uh, well, I well, was growing up, I saw like Bitcoin in the news a lot, even though I was really young. I kept seeing in like the news articles and I didn't really understand it because when I was re really young, Bitcoin was kind of like that, I guess, in a way, magical, like that thing that nobody, you know, that exists, but nobody really knows that much about it. And then I watched some like YouTube videos about it. Like back then, I think Bitcoin, because of like Tor and dark web, I really associated Bitcoin with like the dark web, you know, something you can't really get, but you know, it's kind of there. But then like, I, uh, I guess I got older and realized like, I learned more about like currencies, like the government and then Bitcoin. I was like, this is insane. And then uh, at the beginning of this year, when I got into NFTs, is when I really like seriously got into like cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And then the first thing I did was like buy invest into Bitcoin. Well, I, I can tell you that stigma of the Silk Road and the dark web made it very hard to, you know, sell Bitcoin or to talk about Bitcoin in the early days. Everyone you'd meet would say, oh, you must be into drugs. You must be into the dark web. And I think that started to change now with NFTs. And this is one of the ideas we had when we started Curio Cards. Rick, what do you think of the idea that while we might not have reached people with, you know, the sound money, the libertarian idea, we might not have reached them with, uh, you know, invisible internet money you can use to buy anything. Maybe we'll reach them with a crypto kitty or a crypto punk. Will we reach the wide populace with NFTs and art? Is that how they'll learn about cryptocurrency? I think that sounds definitely started. Didn't Wasn't that way in wave one, as you and I know, in our journey, which was, you know, we were kind of too early. So it made it very, very tough. But now I think people, it's kind of the reverse. They're learning about NFTs and then they're getting into crypto and other things because they want to buy NFTs. Um, so the, the door's definitely open. And then, you know, I think uh, it's a very exciting time for sure. Well, it's different than the last time because the last time it was ICOs and it was these kind of stocks. And stocks are a lot more fuzzy when you buy art. If you buy a one of one, you own the art, you own the one of one. Uh, Yona, what do you think about the idea that this time it could be NFTs that drive the next wave, not ICOs or stocks? I'm really bullish on that. I think I I know a lot of people are saying this is just like the ICOs from 2017. I completely disagree. Um, I think this is very different. I know there's a lot of people that are thinking of NFTs for the long run and building things that you know, that last things in the metaverse, um, that's the, 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 also the new um, web three, and it's all, a lot of it is based on NFTs. And I think people, I think a lot of people are underestimating the power this is going to have. 
especially in the industry like art and music. I mean, we have we still haven't seen that much NFTs in music. I think it's like the killer app for music that there's so many musicians that are stuck in really bad contracts and not getting paid at all. And NFTs can completely change that just like it's changed, you know, a lot of visual artists lives. I'm sure it will change a lot of music, a lot of musicians lives and and it's it's still the beginning. There's so many things that can be done with NFTs. One of the things I really like about NFTs is if you're a, a physical creator and you make artwork like Yonat, you paint. When you're done painting, you put it down, you put it away. It is the painting. But if you make something digitally like a video or a, a Photoshop or an image on the computer, when it's done, there is no original. There's no way to say this is the final copy. I'm publishing this. I'm printing this. Uh, Andy, what do you think of the idea that now with an NFT, you can take something like an image that you make on Blender, put the NFT out there as the original, as the representation, the signature of the artist, and thus you have something equal to what Yonat would have with the, the, the canvas. You have an original to now sell. Yeah, I think the, um, the drive of NFTs is giving a lot of like digital 3D artists a lot more freedom. Because before, if you did digital art, I think Beeple is a great example of this. Um, before that, NFTs weren't really known. I think NFTs for digital artists really blew up in like February, March when Beeple minted his um, first NFTs on Nifty Gateway. Because before, uh, digital artists had to rely a lot on prints or things similar to prints to really make any money off their art. Because um, before, you can't really verify the authentic authenticity of a file that you can just copy and paste. But I think that since NFTs came out and a lot more artists are learning about it, it's giving uh, digital artists especially a lot more freedom uh, in the market. Now, what do you guys think about the digital flexing? I've heard that Twitter is going to link your account to your wallet or to OpenSea so that if you want to use your CryptoPunk or your Curio card as your avatar, they will confirm it. Uh, Rick, what do you think about that? Will that lead NFTs forward? No, I think it will. I mean, I think it's kind of funny because I think it, the, the new blue check mark is now the NFTs. Uh, but early on in February, it was kind of funny because I know a lot of people were buying NFTs and it was talking to them what they're doing. And they're like, oh, I'm showing my friends because, you know, we're all in lockdown. And then people started then using them on their backgrounds, you know, for uh, like, a, you know, Zoom call like we're on. And then now the, the kind of micro flexes, they're putting it on their Apple Watch. And so I think this is the next <laughs> next wave. <laughs> Um, iteration. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's fun and cool. It's also about the portability. Uh, recently I've started buying movies on Apple movies and, you know, I have Blu-rays, I have DVDs. Sure. I could always get the movie other ways, but now I'm buying it on Apple movies. And what I like about it is that it goes on all my devices. So it's on the phone, it's on the computer, it's on the iPad, all that kind of stuff. Yet at the same time, I don't own anything. Uh, so much of my stuff is books and it's heavy stuff and I keep moving it around and it's so nice to own something without owning something. Uh, Yonat, what do you think about that? Do you think the future people might value the NFT more than the original? Maybe the original is too much work. You have to buy a frame, you have to lug it around. Is there a possibility it could go the other way? I think both things will, I think there will still be value to the physical, but I think um, the digital is getting, especially now with, with everything, you know, we're getting used to the fact that everything is digital. And, um, and yeah, definitely it's, it's easier to, to move around. There's something about physical art that, you know, it requires shipping, it requires handling, it requires, you know, um, keeping it in shape sometimes. I, 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 I'm not of the believers that it will completely cease to exist. I think there's, you know, there's still quality to, there's still an importance to something physical. There's still, you know, when you walk into a museum and see physical artworks, it's a different sensation, at least for me, you know, than, than something digital. When you take a book, you can smell it, you know, it, it smells like a book. It's different than, you know, reading on your iPad. Um, so I think, I think there's still a value in physical, uh, but definitely there will be a lot more digital. I think part of the, you know, you're talking about flexing. I think part of it, you know, fashion, 
it's funny, like a, about a year ago, I was trying to pitch with, with a friend, um, with another artist that I'm working with, um, who's connected to Louis Vuitton. We were trying to pitch them to make these luxury watches with NFTs. And now they're, they're doing some of that, but um, they still, yeah, they, I think all these luxury brands take it takes them time to get on with you know new trends, but I think people will be you know wearing their NFTs as well on bags, on watches, on jewelry, on you know whatever digital clothing will be in the future as well. I do think they're going to break through. They were talking a lot about digital threads and other kind of things where they can display images on clothes. This is a little bit of an NFT that Robeck made. Uh, called the physical art fallacy, uh, the fallacy de arta physica. And uh, it's just a series of Robeck opening paintings and uh, the glass is consistently broken on these paintings that he's been shipped. Uh, so in each one, he has a painting and he has physical broken glass everywhere. And you can see this, the shards of glass. Uh, Andy, what do you think about this idea that the NFT could be more valuable or even more interesting to a collector than the physical. Certainly you make a lot of digital art. Uh, you've grown up in probably a digital world. Maybe you had eBooks as a child, uh, Kindle tablets, things like this. Uh, do you live in a digital first world? Yeah. Um, I think the digital in the future is going to, um, be a lot more important. I don't think, I think, um, when it comes to digital art, it's definitely not going to be uh, ignorable in the future just because of the way that NFTs are going to, I think, a large part of art in the future is going to be digital. I think we're seeing, since we're seeing a lot of uh, auctions, like the CryptoPunks auction uh, by Christie's and Sotheby's, the Bored Apes, the Beeples, um, I think, and the Fuck Renders, like these in the future are going to be, it might just be like these um, digital pieces will have enough the same amount of auctions as the physical ones, where in a day, if we see like an auction by Christie's, I think there might even be more digital pieces, NFTs, than the physical ones in the future. Just a series of screens on the wall. Now, uh, Rick, you were there when we created the Curio Cards. I think it was in my apartment in San Francisco. And what does it feel like now to have them being selling at Christie's and what this says for the entire NFT movement? Uh, it still feels surreal. I mean, it's kind of, I remember when you, Travis, and I first met, and then we were trying to find a tech person. And then, you know, I suggested Rhett, and so did Ryan Singer. And then we went out and got Rhett. And so, yeah, it feels still unreal. I don't know, um, maybe maybe this weekend or next week or the next month, it'll start feeling more real. But it's uh, it's pretty cool and pretty wild. Never thought when we were doing it back then that it would make Christie's. Absolutely. Well, they, they say, you know, no one ever has a failed startup come back to life. If your startup goes out there, you make your MVP, you do the best you can, you promote it to everybody, you try to get it out there, and then it kind of goes away. You go on, you get other, other jobs, you move along. Uh, but with our startup, what's so neat is that with our MVP, we made these valuable tokens that just sat out there on the blockchain waiting to be discovered. Uh, Yona, what do you think about the idea of these older and and older nfts being more valuable and does it inspire you to make nfts and then maybe sell them in four years well i am making nfts so i started uh more than yeah in early 2020 um yeah i think for sure there's a there's a huge value in the first ones i um just because I, for me, the first ones, the beauty of them is that they weren't, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't there making them, but I know that they weren't for, you know, let's make an NFT and sell it for loads of money. It was just having fun, you know, and making art and, you know, the whole story of rare peps and of courier cards. And it was, it was really about, you know, just, having fun and making art and I think that's a beautiful thing and that's for me that's their value um that it wasn't about you know let's make money or or kind of what's happening a little bit now as well so they definitely have they're like the first cave paintings in the digital era no <laughs> what's so interesting now is it a lot of the products are are generative art 
And it seems really interesting at first, like, you know, it has a hat or it has a cigar or it has eyeglasses or whatever. But then when you really get down to it and it's, you know, art made by a computer, maybe even art made by a corporation, like you're saying, just a quick play, like let's put cats out there, let's put dogs, uh, let's put fish, let's put whales. Uh, you know, I thought of somebody's project there. But, uh, you know, what do you think of that idea that is it really empowering artists or is it empowering these corporations of generative artists? I'll go to Yonat first, then I'll go to Andy. Um, I think there's some, I, I think there's something interesting about generative art, not, not specifically the ones that are creating the, the you know, the 10,000 profile pick ones, but there's something interesting about using computer to make art. And I think the artists that use, um, I, I'm also getting in, I'm also working with a coder now to, to create different forms of art because there's something interesting about using the actual tech to make a, an artistic statement. So I think when you use you know, coding as a medium, kind of like, at, like you use paint as a medium, then there's something very interesting about that. If it's just, you know, to create, to create, you know, the whales or whatever, then it's a different story. I think there are very different um, ways to look at generative art. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's everything here. That's part of this, you know, part of the crypto story is that it's the wild west and you get real artists that are doing beautiful things and you get people that just want to make money and but you know i think it's both of them are part of this new frontier i can't i guess you can't have one without the other so well we need to ship ten thousand units by friday uh, yeah. andy, andy what do you think about the generative art do you think it's uh, unique and creative or kind of repetitive uh i think the generative art is definitely interesting um when it comes to repet repetitive or unique, I think there's definitely a lot of unique projects like Kira cards, but there's at the same time, there's a lot of like these repetitive, I guess, ape or punk derivatives, where if you look at, you know, different blockchains, even this, the Solana blockchain, um, there's a lot of, I guess you can call it not ripoffs, but like derivatives copied ver like um, um, styles of this art. But at the same time, if you go on OpenSea, there's a lot of unique um, generative projects where there are ideas that are, are completely original and they're special. I think the special ones that are just punks or uh, ape derivatives are the ones that, that really do make it in the generative market. Um, and I think for one of ones, um, one of ones I think definitely have a place. I'm I do one of ones primarily, but at the same time, I had um, I was working on a generative project, and I think these uh, generative compared to like the I guess one of ones of artists. The generative, because of the volume, I guess, um, attracts a lot more people. There's a lot more hype right now for collectibles. But at the same time, I think one of ones um, are more art based, whereas the um, generative are more hype based. Now, it's, it's strange for me to say, because I you know brought in the idea that we should do curio cards like baseball cards and you know, we made 2000 of the apples or whatever it is. Uh, but I really do like the idea of the one of one. For me, the one of one fits up really well with the art piece. You make an art piece, you make one NFT of it, you sell that NFT, it goes the way it wants to go. I mean, I know when I made my NFTs, when I made some recently for fun, I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll make one, but then I want to have one. And then I want to have one in case I sell too early. So I'm up to three and then maybe a couple more. So now I'm up to five and it's just, it gets out of control. Whereas there's something beautiful about that, just the one. And even if it's a crypto punk and it's got red hair or blue hair or whatever, there's one of them, you know, it's pretty neat. Rick, uh, what do you think about one of ones and generative projects compared to curio cards? I like all of them, but I look at them differently. So you think of it like food or wine, you know, I think they all have their own unique place and it, it's fun. And, you know, I'm also into, I know this gets controversial, but I also in its own right and place, I also like super NFTs too. So what's a super nft a super nft is it could be a one-on-one -on -one, but you also can get the physical piece <laughs> that would be cool well and there's yeah. something that's kind of like e-gotting right you're like i got the physical yeah. piece i got the <laughs> nft i met the artist i shook his hand I mean, you're, you're checking off a lot of boxes there um but it's sure. a lot of fun so um let's see what else we have to talk about 
Um, Black Cherry, do you have anything that you've been working on recently? Anything coming up? Uh, going on? Uh, we, well, I recently, the last thing um, I was working on uh, was some generative projects with a couple uh, people. But the, what I'm really excited about is this drop. As you can see on my website, um, that's the only thing I have listed. There are, um, I am doing a few more drops after this, but this is the only thing that's being listed right now just because I'm like super anticipated for this uh, project. And now you're working with Yonat on this job. Uh, how did that go together? Did you uh, work together on a physical piece or, or collaborate digitally? Um, well, we collaborated digitally mainly. Um, I think there are physical pieces, but um, it's mainly digital. And Yonat? Yes, I met both Yonat and, and, and Andy. I mean, so uh, Andy, we met um, on Clubhouse, and then Yonat and I met on LinkedIn. And then, you know, basically saw their different styles and said, hey, this would be kind of cool if they could do a collab. So kind of approached both of them and then did the intro. So. Uh, so is this the final piece here? No, that's... Um a separate piece that I was working on. That's not part of the uh, collab. That's just a um, album cover I was doing for someone. Okay, so doing... when, does, uh, when does the piece come out? Um, I'm... The date we uh, set was October the 14th. All right, and uh, Yona, what was it like working on the piece? Have you ever worked on a piece uh, with someone in a different location uh, over a great distance like this? Um, yeah, I've done I've done collabs before with someone in a different location. Um, yeah, I think today we're we're getting used to everything being on on Zoom and um, and and talking about things over you know digitally. Um, this collab is is I think we kind of work together on the idea, so we're doing a. Um, a series about we're talking about freedom so what is freedom and i think it, it, it's part of like the whole talk about um what is the promise of bitcoin and crypto in this new world with you know is decentralization the new um step in the quest for for in in humanity's quest for freedom um so this is what the this is what the whole series it's it's more a series than one piece it's six pieces actually um, that we each worked on three, but we worked together on the concept and about the idea. Um, and it's basically looking at the way it, the way history and 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 people related to to freedom and what were the battles for freedom, how it kind of went back and forth throughout history, from you know from freedom to sometimes dictatorships, and you know what are people looking for? What does that even mean? Because I think if you ask a lot different people, they'll, they'll have different opinions about it. Some people think it's about, you know, individual freedom and property rights. And some people think it's about everyone having equality. And sometimes those things don't mix together. And, and maybe Bitcoin is the thing that will bring those two together. You know, the equality, a place for everyone and individual freedom and property rights. And maybe this is the next, um, you know, the next step in humanity's quest for freedom. So the whole drop is about this it's kind of like the story of how this progressed through history. And it's six pieces. And yeah, we'll reveal it little by little in the next few weeks, the next two weeks. Um, but the drop is on October 14th on OpenSea. And so it's on OpenSea, these are NFTs or are there original physical pieces that go with these? So they're NFTs, but they're based. So Andy is a dig is digital, digitally native in his work. So his work, his pieces are digital and they come, but all of our pieces, mine are based on oil paintings but they all come, so we're doing kind of like a game with this. So there will be additions and some of the pieces will have unlockable contents that are going to be kind of like a secret code that if you get this code, then you win the physical either oil painting or 
if it's the digital work, then an infinite object, which is um, these beautiful screens that um, that that show the physical, the digital work. So you can, if you purchase one of the NFTs, you can win the physical work. And uh, Andy, what do you think about this? Have you ever been involved in an NFT where you have kind of a scavenger hunt and a path to go down this kind of a gamification? No, yeah, I think there are NFTs where you can buy where you receive the piece, but I think this is unique in the way that it's more of a game because every because um, the ones that you do receive a physical piece, it, they're randomly chosen. And it's not guaranteed that we buy a piece, uh, you'll receive the physical one. So it's kind of like a gamble. When you buy a piece, you either have uh, get the physical one or you don't get the physical one. And Rick, what do you think? These kind of linking of the physical and the NFT, as well as the games, do you think that more NFTs will be produced like this in the future? Um, I think different ones can. I mean, I come, you know, I've also worked in gaming and gamification. And to me, it also seems like, you know, in the old days when you reach down into your cereal box or Cracker Jacks and did I get what I wanted or do I have to eat another box? <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's fun and cool. Well, that sounds great. And it's going to be October 14th on OpenSea. And I'm sure you guys will be talking about it more. Uh, Yona, where can people find out more about your work? Uh, my site on my site, <laughs> my site is <laughs> www.yonatbacks.com. Um, I'm also the most active on Twitter, which is um, at yonatbax. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's where I post uh, all the new works. I also have a newsletter on my site. So that's where I write about any new works. I have a lot of projects ahead. So yeah, that's the best place to know all about the next things that are coming up. And Andy, where can we keep up with Black Cherry? So I have a site, uh, www.blackcherry, B-L-X. CKcherry.co.co and my Instagram, where I'm most active, is Black Cherry Co. B L X C Cherry C O. And that's the same with my Twitter. That's great. And Rick, where can we learn about more about NFTV Miami? Yeah, we've been pretty much in stealth mode, but it's going to be, you know, on our website. Um, so that's, uh, nft-ventures.com and then we'll be reposting on uh crypto twitter instagram uh facebook linkedin so all the usual very cool well thanks so much everyone for joining me uh, it's been really cool to talk to you guys about art and uh, until next time bye bye <laughs> thanks, thanks thanks for having us